Mexico Embassy film and here we begin the fog. I'm John Carpenter and sitting next to me is Deborah Hill. And as I recall, Deborah, it was your idea to put this Edgar Allan Poe quote on uh, this movie, is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream. And that was near the end of uh, post-production when we were still trying to uh, make this movie work. Deborah and I made this movie back in 1979 and uh, it was released and it was somewhat successful at the time. But originally this was a movie that uh, we made once and then had to remake it because it didn't work. And here we are with John Hausman. He's beginning to tell a little ghost story to these kids. Do you remember where we shot this? We shot it on the sound stage over at, uh, what was that called there? On Producers? Melrose. Was it Producers or yeah. Raleigh Studios? Mm -hmm. We um, shot this on a sound stage. It was supposed to take place outside, um, like on a beach, and so we just recreated it. And those are my friend Nancy Jacoby's children, yeah. Lori and Lindsay Arendt. Hundred years ago, on the twenty-first of we were traveling in 1977 in uh, in England. We went to see Stonehenge, and I recall at the time, I kind of came up with the idea of uh, of having something come out of the fog. And it was a very, very thin idea at the time. We developed it into the screenplay. We had a two-picture deal with Avco Embassy, and this was the first of two, the second being Escape from New York. John Hausman worked one day telling the story. As I recall, he blew his line several times. <laughs> Yeah, I can remember that fog bank when we were in England. I mean, it was just sort of sitting on the horizon way, you know, way past Stonehenge. And you said to me, what if there's something in that fog? You know, wouldn't that be scary? And that's how it sort of evolved. What we wanted to do in this movie, as opposed to the film we'd made the year before, Halloween, we wanted to make an old-fashioned ghost story and kind of go back to what you're seeing at this moment, which is John Hausman sitting over a campfire telling a story to kids. And there's Ty Mitchell, who uh, plays uh, Adrienne's son in the movie. He's a sweet kid. Right now, I understand he's grown up and uh, trying to pursue a career in acting. Dean Cundy shot this movie, and as usual, his lighting is beautiful and and uh, appropriate for the for the mood. We shot it again in Panavision, widescreen, two, three, five to one aspect ratio. Grandfathers that when the fog returns to Antonio Bay, the men at the bottom of the sea, out in the water by Spivey Point, will rise up. Pretty soon here we're going to crane up over John Hausman and uh, reveal uh, Antonio Bay, California, which is in reality um, Point Reyes, California, 40 miles north of San Francisco. We went on a scouting trip and found uh, this beautiful area. Here we go. We're craning up on a sound stage, and in the middle here, there'll be a dissolve to uh, a location shot. How we found the location actually was uh, we took a trip up the coastline, up um, Route 1, and uh, we stopped at all these different lighthouses along the way. And when we stopped at this particular lighthouse, it just was perched out on a cliff, and it looked very scary. It was really very, very beautiful and very, very moody. And so that's how we chose this particular area to make this picture. And it turned out that it's the second foggiest point in America, the first uh, being uh, Nantucket Island. It's a Deborah Hill production, and now we are... Uh, panning down in, uh, I believe this is uh, over in uh, Altadena. It's a church uh, which has been used for several films. And now you're going to see me appear uh, basically with dark hair and more of it. <laughs> I'm playing, uh, there I go. I'm playing kind of a, the guy who cleans up the church. I had a chance in this movie to actually act with Hal Holbrook in a scene, and I'm terrible. So I stopped doing roles in movies after this, except for helicopter pilots and walk-ons. And body bags. That's true, yeah. but I would play the dead guy. <laughs> so here I come into our soundstage, and Hal Holbrook is uh, having a little uh, something to drink, and I deliver my lines. This was one of the most terrifying moments in my life having to d deliver these lines to a, an accomplished actor like Hal. Would you like something to keep and the crew was all laughing at me. 
Oh my God, I was good. young. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Why don't you come in and... What, did, what was the budget of this film, Deborah? The budget of this picture was $1.1 million. So it's actually 900 and some thousand dollars. And then we went back after we made this picture, uh, we realized that it was, there were problems with the scares. And uh, we had to get a little bit more, I think, a little gorier. I think at that time, David Cronenberg had just come out with scanners. And um, he had taken the genre to a point when we had to go back and reassess some of the scares in this movie. So we added a couple hundred thousand dollars. And we had a rock fall in foreground there, which is a cheap trick. And now we're into uh, the discovery of the ancient book that holds the entire clue to the story. Basically, this beginning uh, was originally scripted in a simpler way. Hal Holbrook discovers uh, this ancient book that, that uh, is a, basically a diary of, of what's happened. The, the original idea is based on uh, something in reality that happened in uh, California history. It was off the coast of Santa Barbara when uh, a ship was sunk carrying... Uh, lots of gold and it was pirated and so forth and I would just added the kind of ghostly aspect but after this we began to um, cut to various places in the town where um, the strange uh, disturbances and circumstances are beginning to happen this evening well really what it is is the hundredth anniversary of an event that took place in this town which was a crashing of a ship against these rocks when um, all these people died and this is the hundredth anniversary and at midnight starts this curse and we're showing various shots of uh, Point I actually Reyes. shot these with yes, my little did. second unit Ray Stella my camera operator and we went out with um, a flashlight and some uh, and, and car lights we had a, I had a station wagon and I would, you know, put this lights on a little piece of a building there and uh, hold, you know, a tree branch in front of the lights to kind of give it a little bit of mood and then we shot it. This particular shot I did myself on a second <laughs> unit down in Los Angeles. This is actually out in the marina. I wanted to get a kind of sense of uh, this being a seaside community. This was in the middle of the night with a very small unit. Again, we were piecing together uh, images to open our film. This is actually on Laurel Canyon Boulevard. This is the, the uh, uh, Canyon Country Store that we shot in one evening. John Strobel. That's correct. Doing his, direct, his acting debut. And this is all natural lighting, basically. We, uh, we, we ran out with a camera, and everything you're seeing here was, was lit only by the lights inside the store. That's why uh, John is standing by the um, refrigerator counter that because that's the only place we had any light. John now owns the restaurant Angeli on Melrose Avenue. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, probably richer than both you and I combined. <laughs> An extended title sequence um, basically to set the mood of the film. Again, Dean shot the movie. He's a fantastic cameraman. Is now uh, one of the best in Hollywood. I believe you met Dean in your uh, low budget uh, Yeah, before days. Halloween, I, um, for, I was a script supervisor and an assistant editor and did all kinds of little stuff. And that's where Dean Cundy and I, we worked on like nine pictures together. And then when we made Halloween, uh, we brought him along. He worked in this thing called a movie van. And for it was of the size of like a Volkswagen van. And that would hold the entire grip, electrical, and um, camera department in this one van. And so when we started making the fog, uh, we brought we actually had a big grip truck and an electric truck and but Larry Franco, our first AD, drove the Winnebago. That's correct. <laughs> so now we're still in uh, a sequence that shot all available light. I believe there's a little bit of light on this sign as he comes around the I corner. I still have the sign. You do? Yeah. And um, again we're in Laurel Canyon here. Um, trying to open the movie with a bit of mood, which we didn't originally have. Now, there, this, this material here, all the little odds and ends are lit. I believe we had one light with us. This is a gas station uh, that's about to light up. This is out in the San Fernando Valley. This gas station has been shot several times because it's a, kind of an older model from the 
I believe it's from the 30s. I just saw this in a TV commercial recently. And there's actually a diopter on this shot right here, which is the foreground is in focus and the background is in focus. It was kind of a fancy uh, shot for us in those days, given the fact that we had about five people on the camera crew. This was all rigged up and it worked pretty well. Car goes up on the lift. Again, we are basically setting the mood of the story. These ghosts are uh, supernatural happenings are taking place in this small town on the coast of Northern California. But basically what you're seeing here is material that we shot uh, after the movie was all completed. And this was a uh, shot to give the film more mood and, and more fear. As I recall at the time we were we were under a lot of pressure to deliver a film that was as frightening as Halloween. Mm -hmm. Halloween was a, a very different kind of movie. Now here we are in uh, Tommy Wallace's house with his wife, uh, Nancy, shooting a little sequence. She's a character in the film and we added this at, at uh, the very end. Uh, basically we did all this work in a month before the film had to be delivered. Again, this is primarily natural lighting we're going to have a big sound effect coming here, and it always seems to work. Again, we're establishing mood. Uh, this, these clocks were shot in the, the uh, small apartment that you and I were living in. There's me, as a little girl. There you are. <laughs> now we're back in, uh, actually, uh, Olima, California. Now we're on Bear Valley Road. This is in a, one of the most beautiful areas in the entire world. It's... Uh, Point Reyes, California, and Inverness. I just recently finished a movie up there called Village of the Damned, and I own a house up there and have lived, lived there for many, many years. Uh, we had a 30-day shooting schedule on this, and we started on a full moon and finished on a full moon. And so you'll see the full moon in the movie quite a lot. Tom Atkins is making his appearance as a truck driver, and pretty soon he's going to pick up Jamie Lee Curtis, hitchhiking. Of course, those are the old days when I guess you could get away with hitchhiking. These days you can't do it. This is actually the center of the epicenter of the 1906 earthquake happened right near this road. And um, it used to be a cow pasture and all the cows fell into this huge crevice. The dialogue scene that, that we're playing here as she gets in is shot in a garage in Inverness, California. <clears throat> it's a Chevron station and when I was recently there, the the owner said, asked me if I wanted to shoot another scene in his garage. I told him it wasn't necessary. This is called Poor Man's Process. And basically, the, uh, the lights, the leaves that are moving across the, the uh, windshield are on a, on a stand, and they're being uh, whipped by the lights behind them. And uh, the truck is being rocked, and uh, they're sitting uh, completely still. This is the way you have to do it when you can't afford to uh, mount the camera and light for night. I think actually this is the way you should do it all the time. I mean, poor man's process. You like it better? I, th I think it's always, well, you can have so much more control over it. And it's, you know, normally when you're towing a car, you know. That's true. You know, you have to light such a huge section of the road and I think <laughs> it always works. It's very difficult at night to uh, do a dialogue scene in a car. Basically behind them in the window, you would be seeing the road back there, but uh, and in order- And perhaps other cars. That's true. But in order to do that, you would have to light the whole thing. Now we have a little special effects sequence, courtesy of Dick Albane, and they pull over. Protecting the actors was a difficult uh, situation when we had to do this, because we don't want to blow glass in their faces. It's exactly 12 minutes after midnight. And this is Stevie Wayne, your night guy. Around until about I believe the next sequence we're going to uh, cut to the lighthouse. There it is. That's uh, on the end of the Point Reyes Peninsula, and Adrian is going to be inside. Uh, Which is on a soundstage now. On a soundstage. This is again in Raleigh Studios. You can't sleep. I just recently married Adrian at this point, and uh, this was, I believe, her first film. Some way to keep you occupied. I think this is really great dialogue too, the Stevie Wayne dialogue here. You know, it's just... Well, you wrote part of it. <laughs> but no, I think it's one of her best performances. I agree okay. with you. She's I terrific mean, in the movie. Yeah, she's really, she really is. Oh, I'm just calling to see if you're uh, lonely. Chuck Cipher's playing the weatherman. 
meteorologist. I changed shift so I can make it to the big party tonight. Again, we're in sound stages primarily here for most of the dialogue. Until I can talk someone else into giving up city life. The uh, set's built by Tommy Lee Wallace, who was our production designer and also our film editor. And we built the lighthouse set both interior and exterior on a sound stage. Because in the end of the movie, we practically destroy the, um, the lighthouse. Again, in low-budget filmmaking, you have to uh, make certain concessions that you're not able to do if you have a high budget. We had a little over a million dollars, so uh, a lot of the film has to be uh, rather simply planned out and simply done. One of the issues we had to deal with was what kind of music was, uh, was being played at the time, and we chose a kind of old, uh, old-fashioned music. Uh, Hits. Now, now we're. That was a miniature, wasn't it? That was a miniature boat. Now we're aboard a real boat with Buck Flower in the foreground and John Goff and uh, James uh, Canning in the background. They're hanging out. We're about to have our first attack. Originally, this scene was scripted with uh, no uh, no overt violence, and uh, you never saw the ghosts. But we had to go back and, uh, as Deborah said, and reshoot all this. Now we're seeing a fog bank come across uh, the water. Just a note, again, on that miniature, too. You have to be very careful whenever you do miniatures with water that the water in relationship to the miniature works. And we um, did, we basically shot all our own effects. We borrowed a camera from um, the old MGM optical department and um, on a weekend. And uh, we, it was a registration pin camera. And we created all our own effects just like that. The fog coming across the water is a miniature. There's a dump tank, a small tank of water, and we dumped uh, dry ice behind it, and the fog is rising up. So the fog is basically created three different ways, one with dry ice, another one with actual foggers, and a third way, I'm trying to remember how the third one was. Now we're in the, uh, basically the uh, control room of the ship, and he's coming in there. This was a real ship that we shot down in San Pedro. And originally the scene was, I believe, supposed to end here, but we carried it on. Uh, that's a miniature uh, boat in a tank with a little fog going over it. We had to be very inventive in those days. Dean Cundy's lighting is uh, extraordinary in this. Now we're doing that's a reverse, reverse shot. shot. Yeah. The fog is turning off the engine. The sequence was filmed later. Again, this was some of the stuff we added at the end on a sound stage. And this is down in the harbor at San Pedro with a real ship going by. And the actors standing uh, on the dock. On the dock. Uh, actually, the actors are on a boat and we're going by the ship, as I recall. Yeah, the um, ship is standing still. That's correct. Let's go. Hey. And now uh, the rest of the sequence here as they turn around is on a small soundstage out in the valley. We shot, uh, again, this was all done in the month before we had to deliver the movie. We added this uh, particular sequence for the, uh, the spookiness and effects. There are the ghosts. Uh, primarily the ghosts that you see are Tommy Wallace and a couple of the, the grips all dressed up in black. Part of the problem going back when, and reshooting or doing additional shooting is matching everything. You know, so you have to keep the wardrobe and you have to redesign and it, um, it takes a lot of thinking, a lot of piecing together. And that's a graphic sequence here that was partially drawn out on paper and partially uh, created by uh, just a lot of coverage and cuts. Now our sailors are dispatched and uh, we now know there's something evil and supernatural in the in the fog. Now we're back to the original footage that we shot, and in comes, uh, I believe this is Tommy Wallace back there, our production designer, who's... And film editor, who's now a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> who's now become a, a director in his own right in Hollywood and probably regrets ever having played a ghost. Plus he also co-wrote El Diablo with you, which we made for HBO. That's correct. Now this is added material here again. 
Back to the miniature, and we're on with our story. And the end of the second reel, I believe. Now we're back in the lighthouse set with uh, Adrienne. This movie was uh, was uh, processed by Metro Color, which was uh, one of the greatest labs in Hollywood. And the color uh, was extraordinary in the film. And uh, Avco, I believe, uh, did the release prints through CFI, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we had a little bit of a battle getting it where we needed it, but uh, the combination of uh, Dean Cundy's uh, lighting and photography and the uh, and the lab situation really uh, produced a beautiful film. Also, it's very moody. You know, you talked a little bit earlier about the music in this movie, um, and we made. Uh, Stevie Wayne uh, have a jazz station because we couldn't afford rock and roll. It's so expensive these days. So we were able to do needle drops with obscure music that kind of added in a way to the mood. Now you see Adrienne smoking a cigarette during this movie. Adrienne has never smoked cigarettes, hates smoking cigarettes. So I had to kind of train her to do it. She actually does a pretty good job. She swore to me that she never inhaled it throughout the whole film, but I'm not so sure. Why did you want her to smoke a cigarette? I think perhaps that her character is based on uh, um, a lot of the uh, Howard Hawks uh, women throughout throughout his movies who all seem to smoke cigarettes, especially Lauren Bacall, who walks in the doorway and the first time you see her, ask Humphrey Bogart for a cigarette. My idea of perfection is a voice on the phone. Okay, mystery lady. Good night. The point of view shots that you're seeing, <clears throat> that Adrienne is seeing here, are shot right from the lighthouse out in Point Reyes. That's a daytime shot that we have altered to make it look like night. You actually shoot those kinds of uh, shots when the sun is high up in the sky, you know, like straight overhead. And then you can do them a couple different ways. You can shoot them black and white and then print them on color. Or you can just put a filter over it that kind of gives you that feeling. And Jamie Lee and Tom Atkins are in bed together. This was shot in a, a very small uh, a kind of house on the water in Inverness. Believe it or not, the, uh, the, the rippling water effect, lighting effect on the window back there has, has to be done with a pan with a broken glass in it and water rippling over it because we couldn't get the light angle correct. Is that where you're from, San Diego? But pretty soon uh, Tom Atkins is going to get up and uh, respond to... Uh, something happening in the other room and you're going to cut from <clears throat> Inverness, California to again Laurel Canyon uh, to the house I was living in at the time. We came back and reshot part of this scene to make it more uh, to more frightening and have more punch to it. I don't know. That's okay, Mimi. Jamie's hair changed a great deal from Halloween. She had nice kind of long uh, 17 and 18 year old hair and now here it is uh, well, she's so much more sophisticated in this particular role than she was as Laurie Strode. She wanted to play a different character. Yeah, and I think she did. Now, there we are in Laurel Canyon. <laughs> I remember that. And then now we're back to Inverness as uh, Tom gets out of the bed. That's uh, back in Laurel Canyon. And back to Inverness. Laurel Canyon. Again, we uh, shot this on a very foggy day, but had to ten in uh, the entire set. Now that we are in uh, Laurel Canyon there, as he backs away from the doors. Again, this sets the mood for the film, uh, even though it wasn't scripted originally. And the clock breaks at one o'clock, and the curse is over for the night. Basically, this movie is done in three acts, the night before, the day of, and the night of, the fog attacking. That's a point of view from, uh, from the actual house there on the bay in Inverness. So until tomorrow night at 6 p.m. when KEB comes back on the air, this is... At low tide. Correct. <laughs> Hoping you have a nice rest of the night. We fade out and now we're into the next day. This is a very, very beautiful location. As we can see, now we're at uh, Drake's Beach. It was a legend has it that Sir Francis Drake landed on this beach uh, with his ships and either traded with the Indians or ripped them off or something. But it's an incredible location. 
And little Ty Mitchell is, uh, is walking his way along the beach here. Actually, we encountered a lot of cold weather up there. It uh, looks very sunny, but it's freezing cold. We were up there in the, I believe it was the winter months, as I recall, March, maybe April, I don't remember. This is right below the area where um, Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> shot the birds. And so it's kind of reminiscent, this feeling of, of that original picture. The gold coin makes it does a disappearing act here. Um, we did it the cheapest and possible way with a cut right there. It's it's cut and now uh, the coin is gone. And now it's aboard. Some of the genre fans criticize the uh, I don't know the the writing on this film in terms of its uh, l logic about ghosts, but my feeling was. Uh, if you're doing a ghost story, there really isn't too much logic to it. This is the house uh, on Tamales Bay, right off of Inverness. Quite a beautiful place. Well, and, let's uh, talk about the Elizabeth Dane for a second, because the ship that went down, the Elizabeth Dane, is named after an old girlfriend of yours. Kind of a combination. Elizabeth <laughs> Elizabeth was the first name. I don't remember where we got Dane, though, Deborah. I think you wrote that part. <laughs> no, I thought Elizabeth uh, Dane was an old girlfriend. Uh, we track across... Uh, Adrienne and an old boyfriend of yours. And an old boyfriend of Adrienne's. That's correct. <laughs> and up comes Ty into the house uh, and onto a set uh, again at Raleigh Studios. Look what I found. I actually still have that quilt. You do? Uh huh. Sure, Mom. But look it. I had forgotten that it's. I have. That's my lamp. Do you still have the lamp? <laughs> yeah. So basically, we used all your furniture <laughs> in the picture. Did you have a nice time last night? Yeah, old Mr. Macon told us ghost stories. Again, the film is rather simply shot in terms of, uh, of its dialogue scenes. We have a, a master and then uh, two over the shoulders, usually utilizing the Panavision frame. Panavision is my favorite, uh, my favorite cinema uh, aspect ratio because it's widescreen and I feel it's uh, the most uh, like a big movie that you'll ever see. It's not uh, the square screen. Now we are actually up in Bodega Bay where Hitchcock shot the uh, birds. This is the, the wharf. Right down there is the restaurant where everybody was trapped and the birds. We had one day to shoot this scene and it's a, kind of an overcast day. It was a beautiful look. This is primarily a fishing area, a farm area, uh, up in Northern California. One of the most incredible areas of all time. Uh, I fell in love with the place, so much so that I bought a house. Make it back in. So good a sailor to stay out there all night and not let somebody know. Sound like it's wild. It's a lot of production value, you know, up here that, you know, we didn't even have to spend dollars for. Big time. You know? Big time. Nice little dolly shot along the, the wharf. We had to bring up uh, the dolly track and and set it up. It was a rather simple shooting day, but uh, we got a lot for our money. You can see the sky kind of clearing out there in the distance, but it's uh, heavily overcast. Yeah. Now we're back in Olima. This was a restaurant called uh, Jerry's Farmhouse, and Janet Lee makes her appearance with uh, Nancy Loomis. It was really fun working with Janet. She's a an incredible pro and um, there's one particular scene in the film where Janet uh, has to cry and for technical reasons she uh, she did it 14 times in a row and her studio training came in incredibly handy this is a Panaglide shot all the uh, set dressing that you see in this parking lot was provided by Tommy Wallace Andy, just be civil to me for another five hours that's all I ask the restaurant is on your right. It's still a delightful place to go to eat. It's changed a great deal, though, now. Janet Lee's playing a mayor, the mayor of the city. Isn't she the mayor of the city who... I believe she's a, um, a booster. I don't think she's the mayor. Don't we have a mayor that stands up and talks to them? Oh, yes, that's correct. <laughs> she's a real estate agent or something. That's right. She's a real estate agent who's <laughs> celebrating. Uh, it's her, I guess, uh, relatives that died, right. ancestors that died. Beautiful uh, shots on the Point Reyes Peninsula as Adrienne is driving the uh, her jeep up to uh, 
up to the lighthouse. This is actually the road to the lighthouse in reality. Camera is mounted on the on the Jeep and Adrian is trucking right along. This was uh, one of our first days of shooting, an incredibly windy day. And we're giving off information here. Sometimes the uh, weather out there gets the, the wind gusts are 65 and 70 knots. They have to close down the lighthouse or you'll be blown off the cliff. This is the Great Beach as, you're, as we're panning to the left and uh, North Beach is on your left coming up. If you sight this vessel, please notify the Coast Guard immediately. Now we are out in the San Pedro Harbor and my least favorite day of filming I can remember in my career, I got <laughs> deathly seasick during this day. The script supervisor and I were in the bottom of this boat blowing our lunch all over the place. <laughs> I don't remember this day shooting. I don't think I was out there. You're luckily not out there. It was I awful. Think I, was, I think I was on the dock. The seasick pills I took did not work. And here you're talking to a helicopter pilot who gets wimps out on a boat. The day was rough on the water. This is a Panaglide shot, uh, which is trying to smooth out the action. Now we're back in uh, in Inverness. I couldn't sleep last night. We're going to do uh, the thankless uh, dialogue scene in the car. These are my least favorite kind of scenes to do. Um, because you're really kind of limited in your angles, on, at least on a low-budget film. You have the camera mounted on the front of the car. You have three kind of choices. You can do a two-shot of the people in the car looking straight back, and then you can cross over for a close-up of the Janet and Nancy. And uh, the other option is to uh, then remount the cameras coming in the side windows. But you are severely limited, especially in widescreen. Later on, uh, as the budgets increased, I, I began to enjoy working with uh, rear screen. Now we're, um, we're back out in the, uh, in the harbor. I recall this day was the worst. As you see, the boats are moving back and forth, and my stomach was moving back and forth. Deborah, you were in the office uh, returning phone calls, which <laughs> I had been in the office, and you had been out on the boat. Yeah, I don't recall this day of filming at all. But I guess we're in the story now where we're building the day before the fog comes again at that night and parallel stories between these people. Well, that's right, and we're intercutting a lot of uh, material. Now, we're driving up in Inverness up a hill. There really is a church up here. We're about to cut from Northern California to Altadena, and this is the church that we found. It's very surprising they let us shoot in here uh, due to the nature of our story. Now we're into another Panaglide shot. This is a beautiful old church. They let us break out their windows. Actually, we, we provided the windows, but they let us replace them. Ray Stella was uh, operating the Panaglide and had learned how to do it on uh, Halloween. And it's uh, it weighs a lot, and his, uh, his operating is really, really good. I think, you know, using the Panaglide on Halloween, we never would have been able to make that movie in 20 days if we had done it the traditional lay the dolly track and, you know, get it even and everything. It was oh, absolutely. Really... And I think that's <laughs> the use of, of the widescreen uh, is what really makes these pictures different than other low-budget pictures of the time. It's because they get a, a bigger, you know... Bang for the buck. Yeah, plus just a bigger reality to the whole thing, you know? You're absolutely right about that. Now look at the beautiful lighting that Dean has done here. Here is a... Here's a trick that we that we did. Hal Holbrook comes out and startles Janet Lee. And originally, when we staged this, you could see uh, Hal Holbrook standing there. So we had the MGM lab uh, work on this, and they darkened the frame back there, so you cannot see him. This is an optical, and there he is. They did a little dissolve, and out he comes. And it worked very well. We put a loud sound in there, and I. Remember at the Avoriots Film Festival, the entire crowd screamed and yelled. So yeah. We were successful. You know, there's a lot of tricks in here that we did with just surprising the audience and sound. And, you, you know, it really worked out well. That's kind of one of the tools you have, uh, isn't it, when you're doing a low budget movie, is uh, using sound effectively. He's a rich man with a cursed condition. Of course, though, we don't have. 
know, nowadays we mix for like four and six weeks. I mean, that is, those days we mixed three days, I think, on this movie. We did, at Ryder Sound, as I recall. Now we're in the real uh, boat down in uh, San Pedro Harbor again, in the, in the uh, control room. We had a little sequence here where uh, Jamie discovers the body of James Canning uh, rolling out uh, rolling out of a cupboard and it didn't work so we went back and reshot part of it it'll be coming up in a minute and we built a set where Jamie goes down below deck and discovers the body it made it more frightening again I suppose we were wrong at the time to try to do an old-fashioned ghost story when the, the audience wanted to see much more overt horror on screen we're intercutting uh, between various uh, characters and parts of the story. A lot of this is due to the diligent work of uh, Tommy Lee Wallace and Charles Bornstein, who were the editors on this. The movie was really made in the editing room and structured uh, to, to provide a coherent narrative. Only for permission to settle here. But again, we were beginning filmmakers and uh, we're trying our best to get on the screen what we could. Uh, there was a great deal of expectation, Deborah, as I remember on us, to provide well, I think one of the things I kept remembering you saying is this, this is going to be as scary as Halloween, you know, because Halloween was such a surprise for us, and we were like kids. I mean, they used to think of us at Goldwyn, where we edited the pictures, where I think you still edit your movies. Uh, what are the kids up to? And that was John and myself. And They don't call me a kid anymore. <laughs> they call me old man. Now, we're in a soundstage at this part of the, uh, of the movie. This is something that we reshot again in those final months before we released the film. As I recall, uh, on the day we were shooting this particular scene, the revolution in Iran had just taken place and the Ayatollah had come back and taken over. Climbing fishing. This is all a uh, built set and uh, reworked dialogue. And the lighting is rather interesting from above. Uh, the shadows are created by Dean Cundy um, and Mark Walthour. Actually, this boat that we built, this interior, was put on a gimbal, so it could actually slightly rock. Which made me as nauseous as the day we <laughs> went out to the harbor. Mm -hmm. Hal again is uh, is uh, reading the uh, the diary of uh, of the lepers, I suppose, that explains what's going on. There's a secret in the diary that we don't discover till the third act. Again, a lot of this movie is 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 based upon. Uh, some of the feelings and, and uh, mood of H.P. Lovecraft, who was one of my favorite writers. Now we're back to the set. Also, do we should talk about the casting of, of a low-budget picture. Sometimes, as we did with Donald Pleasance, is, you know, we had got extra money for him. But with Hal Holbrook, we only had a little bit of money, so we had to put all of his scenes together. And we had to build a sound, you know, build a set for him to work on. And um, the same thing for John Hausman, by doing his whole scene. I think that was like six or seven pages in one day. And I think a typical Hollywood picture averages around two to three pages. It's true. And uh, everybody was frightened of John Hausman when we were on the set because he was such a powerful presence and because he's produced so many great movies. And. Um, he did swear when he blew his line, so we all felt better. <laughs> Again, we're leading up to a little scare scene here as the light plays back and forth on, on Tom Atkins as he's telling his story. Just as the quote you suggested from Poe, we're, we're, we're dealing with stories within stories and basically dealing in the area of, of the ghost story, the haunted, uh, the haunted town, the haunted ship. Kind of evocative of an earlier era in uh, literature and movies. There was food on the table, and a hot, steamy cup of coffee, but underneath, the tin cup was... And we're about to get a good scare here, I believe. We set it up with a little movement there on the, on the locker. I believe once again, Tommy Lee Wallace is behind there moving the door. He, he was basically doing everything that, that needed to be done. By giving the audience the 
the visual image and the and the sound of that locker moving, you know something's going to happen. The question becomes, when is it? When does it happen? And there, it blows open, but there's really nothing there. We think. And behind Jamie comes the hideous shape, and now we've we're out of our cheap scare back to Hal Holbrook. Those those kind of scares. Uh, we sort of started doing that in Halloween and carried it on to the fog. Nowadays, that, that kind of thing probably doesn't scare people anymore. Those are the old days. It rolled in as if heaven sent, although God had no part in our actions. Tonight. It's funny to watch these movies now. They seem so innocent. And at the time, I recall, we, we would always receive lots of criticism for being makers of, of horror films. It's funny how times change. Father had a way with words. celebration tonight is a travesty. We're honoring murderers. So here we are on our first day of shooting, and this is um, Adrienne driving her Jeep up to the lighthouse. And um, it was a very, very, very windy day. And the lighthouse is actually down these steps. It's, you actually, the greatest shot of the lighthouse is when you're out in the ocean looking back at it because it's on the side of a mountain. So it caused quite considerable problems in shooting it. And we ended up having to shoot a number of plates of it and then using that for, to put the fog, actually marry the fog to it. Uh, what's interesting is lighthouses are run by the National Park Services around the country and they man them. And um, there was actually like a, an elevator that goes down the steps to the side. We rise up over the uh, gate here and the side and we reveal down at the very bottom the lighthouse. The lighthouse is not full size. It's, it's kind of a short guy, but it's extremely beautiful. Yeah, it's very untypical of what you consider a lighthouse, which is a very tall tower. And the tower being so tall is so other ships can see the beacon. Um, but this is built uh, way out on a point, and um, that's the reason why it's, it's put out there. Nice little handheld shot by Ray Stella there. This is the wind, uh, as Deborah said, is so incredible. Now we're down at the lighthouse proper. It's really beautiful. And they still have the glass and the mechanism in there, but they don't use it anymore. They have an automated uh, light, right? As a matter of fact, there it is, rotating next to the lighthouse. And now we're, I believe, we're on our set, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, this is the set. This is um, down on Melrose. And um, it's a two-story set, which was kind of uh, fun to build. These are the uh, steps uh, from uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which we, we kind of uh, found in a... And now we're on the upper level. And a lot of the shots that we shot uh, looking into the lighthouse, we shot sort of at a low angle looking up because we didn't really, couldn't afford to, to, uh, to put, you know, screens outside and stuff like that. And it's kind of a very low tech um, DJ station in many, many ways. We romanticized the idea of a radio station, putting it in a lighthouse. I thought that was a great idea. And now we're back at uh, the other set um, with Hal Holbrook, and there a lot of a lot of these scenes have to do with the plot of the movie, reading the um, uh, the diary, and discovering like exactly what is going to happen. So we kind of foreshadow or tell the audience um, before the characters know what's going to happen. I'm fond of this shot. Uh, Hal is in in darkness here; he's barely lit. And uh, Janet and Nancy are, are under light, but uh, it really gives him a moody feel. Plus, it's hard to hold focus for that depth at this light. Oh, absolutely. It's one of the neat things about Dean Cundy is that um, when we did Escape from New York, which is the next film after this, Dean also shot it, uh, we used uh, a Panavision camera as well, but we used accompaniment of lenses that were the first time they were ever used, and they were all, you know, like, I think we lit that at, like, foot candles rather than <laughs> f-stops. Wasn't that the Panatars? <laughs> yeah. The, fast, mm -hmm. the speed, fast lenses? Yeah. Fast lenses. He was the first cameraman in the United States to use those. I mean, everything was sort of shot at a two. Four, 
So we leave Hal uh, there and we come back to the lighthouse. Uh, there's a fan, an E fan on the on the uh, the sheets outside, and now we begin to do a little supernatural trick here. This is a uh, a kind of again a ghost uh, ghostly approach to the supernatural. Uh, they're sending a message. We we come down off the the uh, dripping sign, and um, we're cutting back and forth. Adrienne is not paying attention. The water goes to the tape recorder and begins to alter the sound, and she begins to hear something very strange on the tape recorder. A voice from uh, Six Must Die. Again, this is in retribution for what happened uh, in the past. Puts out the fire, and everything is back to normal again. These kinds of things are fun. They're really 19th century uh, 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 pulp fiction, uh, penny dreadful uh, techniques, but uh, they're really fun to do in a movie. Every hour on the hour, and the sound returns to normal, and uh, now Adrienne has had a supernatural experience, which is going to color what she does in the rest of the film. Basically, our main characters pretty much have uh, encountered... Uh, encountered uh, very strange things. Now we're back out in the that awful day in the um, out of San Pedro. Oh, again. lordy, lordy, lordy. So there you are with the Panaglide again. And I think one of the reasons why we went with the Panaglide on this particular shot on this day was because um, it, we didn't have to bring all this equipment aboard these boats. And the boat was small and we, you know, had as few uh, crew members on, on this boat as possible. Now we're back in Inverness in the actual house. Uh, when we recently were up there making Village of the Dam, this is the house that the assistant directors lived in. A very beautiful place. Andy, where did you get that? Really? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Yes, we rented the house. <laughs> where? By the rocks. What was it doing? First it was a So this is where Adrienne's having a conversation with uh, her son, and she's really frightened because she knows that something's something's wrong but um, she can't make it back in time and so she wants them to lock the doors and don't answer if anybody knocks and hey. is mrs Colbert's there she just came in mrs Colbert's, uh is the uh, the babysitter uh, Colbert's is the name that i've used uh, from a producer that i worked with on a tv movie richard Colbert's. He went on to produce uh, Christine for me. He was a very, very nice man and a very influential producer. And and uh, I decided to give him a little uh, tip of the hat. And that TV movie is where you met Adrienne. That's correct. Starred uh, Lauren Hutton and Adrienne Barbeau. What was it called? And David Burney. Uh, Someone's watching me. That's right. Now, I am told by um, radio aficionados that uh, what she's doing in terms of turning on the the microphone is completely wrong. <laughs> There's a sign that says on the air that pops on. and I was admonished by uh, an interviewer for not getting my, my uh, technical stuff correct, but uh, I don't think the audience minded too much. Well, but I also think that we were trying to go for a very low-tech, old-fashioned kind of radio station. I mean, I think those were deliberate choices that we made at the time. And I still got the t tongue lashing from this... Uh, from this fella. Now we pull back from the radio and uh, we're in uh, Inverness. It's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, live location. Uh, this is a very difficult shot to, to light because of the, the daylight outside. You have to pump light on the actors in the foreground. But again, Dean Cundy is uh, kind of a master of that. By going to this location gave us such value. And this, once again, this is a, a plate. We shot um, fog separately and the dock separately, and we put them together, composited them together. Again, this is uh, some of the material we shot later on uh, after we'd finished the movie and realized we had to, to redo it. This is a scene uh, that includes Darwin Jostin. He was an actor in Assault on Precinct 13, the movie that you and I first met him on. That's right. And uh, 
This was shot in a little small clinic, I believe, in the, in the San Fernando Valley. We added this to uh, add another scare to the film where this corpse comes back to life. As I remember, the corpse is uh, John Strobel, who appeared in the first uh, scene. Oh, yes, I think you're and right. He, now he makes another appearance as a corpse. <laughs> a different character. We uh, <laughs> kind of recycle as much as possible in these low-budget films. <laughs> Yeah, I remember Darwin. He did such a good performance in Assault on Precinct. Oh, it was fantastic. He was really good. Very, very good. As a matter of fact, somebody was casting a picture not too recently. Could have been, maybe it was Joe Dante, and he called me about getting the original cast members of Assault on Precinct 13. Oh, that'd be great. Well, again, we're setting up uh, cinematically here that Jamie's alone in a room with a corpse, and the corpse is moving, the sheet is moving and she's not paying attention, and the audience is ahead. First time I saw this, this scene as a kid, it worked, so we decided to put it back in the picture. What did you see it in as a kid? I can't even remember now, probably the tingler. Dick Baxter died in the ocean. That's my favorite angle in the scene, shot from underneath the gurney as the legs uh, come down. October, those three kids that went diving for that old boat off the point. Yeah. We Again, looking at the film from our perspective now, you can see how much of it was structured in the editing room. Unlike Halloween, these uh, these scenes are done in uh, in shots as opposed to long takes, and uh, constructed uh, for tempo and. Uh, and so, visual impact. Well, they're very different. I mean, Halloween was so lyrical in the way that it was shot, you know, in terms of the way the camera moved all the time, and then we went from the shape's point of view a lot of the times. And this was really a different kind of storytelling. I mean, there was really very little story in Halloween. It was all about style, I think. That's a really good way of putting it, too, is a lyrical movie. This is a much more dense film visually has a lot more cuts, and then now we're seeing the second unit shots yeah, these all are, around Point Reyes. These are ones that I did with uh, Ray Stella, and um, we did them over a couple of day periods, and and uh, just to sort of set up the mood and the foggy. I mean, this this is real fog here, and we'd hope to use this that it would be rolling in. Such a beautiful place. And we're also using this to go bridge from us from day to nightfall. Essentially, this shot was shot in the day, and then we um, used a uh, filter for the gradation at the top. We're back to your second unit again <laughs> with car headlights and flashlights. <laughs> Very effective, I must. I might <laughs> That's even. why when people tell me they're going to shoot second unit and they have like a DP and an operator and a gaffer and a grip, and I mean, I go, what do you need all this for? You know? You've done it already. <laughs> you don't need this stuff. We're back in the parking lot of uh, Jerry's farmhouse uh, in Olima for our uh, night scene. The mayor, I believe, that's the mayor yes. talking. And yeah. uh, a lot of locals were in this scene, as I recall. Um, they were rather shocked that uh, we connected all the all the parts of town they knew weren't connected. Here we have the scene I'm telling oh, look, you about. There's Bill. Um Bill Taylor's Bill in the Taylor background. Bill Taylor back there. Bill Taylor is not an actor. Bill Taylor is actually a, a wonderful, wonderful camera. What do we call him? Like a special effects camera person. That's right. And a good magician. And he worked for many years with Albert Whitlock at Universal, who made all those incredibly beautiful mat shots. This was the scene I was referring to where Janet had to uh, become emotional several times in a row. And that she always came through. She was... Uh, Absolutely fun to work with and uh, completely professional. It was a great experience. Can't have the chair lady of the birthday celebration in tears, can I don't we? think you ought to go out. Oh, I think that's... This bar we're shooting in at the farmhouse was a, a favorite of the crew to come in after hours and relax at the bar and watch television or listen to country music. A great collection of Elvis statues uh, is right over on the left out of frame. It's interesting how you shot this scene in one shot. That's why it took 14 takes. Didn't You didn't want any cuts in it? No, I believe we had a tracking shot from here on. I don't know if we still have it. There we go. I hope you remember it. We come back around into a two-shot for dialogue. Happy 100th 
This is one of the longer uh, scenes. Now we're cutting away to a shot done over in Paramount Drive where you and I used to live mm -hmm. as an intercut and now coming back as we've dropped part of the scene. The Coast Guard dropped me a note saying they found the seagrass earlier this afternoon. But there's no further word as to the condition of the ship. This really was a story told in the editing room, wasn't it? I mean, now that I look back at it, haven't seen it for quite a long time. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? We all we structured this whole thing throughout the summer of 79, then confronted the issue that we needed more work on the film. Well, I can remember going out for lunch with Bob Remy and telling him that we needed more. And he said, how much will it cost? Remember that? I remember. And he said it was really worth it. Bob Remy, who's now a producer on his own, he made Patriot Games and all those big movies with Harrison Ford. He ran AFCO Embassy in those days. He admonished us at one point, he said, um, maybe the problem is it's a ghost story because people don't usually go to see ghost stories unless it's Casper and they're friendly ghosts. Now here we have an effects shot. We've done this uh, in, in two passes. One is uh, the shot of the point that you just saw and the other is uh, a miniature. We and built the miniatures in black velvet on the, uh, on the uh, floor of a little soundstage out in the valley and using this registration pin camera that we borrowed from um, MGM we were able to use different forms of fog most most of it being um, dry ice and have the fog go in and around the crevices of the rock of the miniature and then when we combined the two as a composite that's what we got a very basic form of you know of special effects photography. I mean, it's quite, nowadays, it's so much more sophisticated. And this particular shot of uh, Chuck Cypher's driving is one that you directed yourself because I had an <laughs> attack of uh, a bad tooth that day. Here we have a That's more a special effects fog. Yeah, that was a fogger. Mm -hmm. So he's some, you know, guy hiding in the woods. It may have nothing to do with the seagrass. I'm very glad you were able to direct that shot, Deborah. <laughs> we would have been behind schedule. <laughs> I was very nervous, John. I much prefer to do things without people in them. <laughs> We're on a set uh, at Raleigh uh, Studios again here. Originally, this particular uh, character had a lot more to do with the movie, but he was, uh, Chuck was cut down uh, when we did our recut on the film. I'm on my way. See you tomorrow. Yeah, Mel, I'll see you. You used this actor and someone to watch over me, right? I didn't direct that, but as someone's no, watching someone's me. No, that someone's watching me. I did. I did. I used, we used him in uh, Assault in Precinct 13. Oh, that's where he, yeah, that's right, Assault in Precinct 13. Once again, back to the fogger, special effect in the woods, and we also have the pulsating light. Right. Point. Want to come? KB. So the movie is beginning to build to the climax here as we connect all our characters with the, the legend of uh, Elizabeth Dane and the ghost lepers that are coming back and uh, everyone is involved. The ghost is, ghost fog is attacking the town and uh, pretty soon things are going to start to happen. And uh, Stevie Wayne becomes sort of the, the voice that tells the town what's going on and warns everybody that something's about to happen. Tommy Atkins did his own driving stunt there in that old truck. Of course, the truck wouldn't go very fast, probably about 20 miles an hour. We're on Bear Valley Road, panning off. Dan, are you still there? I'm still here. <laughs> hey, you, uh... That's another problem with low budget movies is that when you have vehicles you don't normally have mechanics that can keep them in running condition. I know when you did Christine you had like five or six different models plus you had all these mechanics on staff all around the clock so that every day the car was running. We, we couldn't afford that kind of stuff on this movie. I had ten times the budget we did on this one, Deborah. Yeah. This was a very, very low budget film. That's a special effects shot with uh, miniature fog over a real shot of uh, of the bay and in the background we begin to see the fog creeping up on uh, on Charles Cyphers there we go and that's a fogger in the background uh, goosing in the billowing fog it makes a great deal of noise as I recall we had to loop some of Chuck's performance here 
the lights go out and he's about to uh, buy the farm. We, uh, we reshot part of this scene on a set uh, again in that last month before release because we felt that uh, there wasn't enough punch to the scene. Shining a light through the window. Dan, listen to me. Hold on, sweetheart. I want to check this out. Dan! He leaves the phone off the hook so Adrienne can hear everything that's going on. It's a kind of a little technique of movie making. Now the knock on the door. Again, this is all very uh, reminiscent of old, uh, of old movies from the 40s and, and 50s that I grew up watching. And the fog comes under the door. Reminds me a whole lot of The Crawling Eye. Yeah. It was one of my Crawling favorite Eye. films. Yeah, one of my favorite ones, too. Except we didn't have the big eyeballs with tentacles, did we? <laughs> so Chuck is going to open the door and uh, buy the farm here. Um, this particular shot here was done later. Rather effective as he's looking out. Hello? Anybody here? Sometimes you're not sure uh, what you're going to need. Now we have our horror scare coming in. I believe that's Tommy Wallace again is standing in as a ghost. Well, when we went back and did some additional reshooting, we had uh, Rob Bottin do some close-ups of uh, ghosts. Worm, worm, worm face was face. Rob Bottin's, yeah. Yeah. Worm face is coming up soon. It's actually a puppet that, that Rob built. Rob came to us and wanted to work on the film. He plays uh, the head ghost in the ending scene. It's always fun to see Rob but do at the that. Top, Rob, at the time, Rob Bottin is, was had done nothing. And he went on to become one of the big special effects people. I think he's even won Academy Awards. And he did The Thing for you. That's right. He won an award for a Total Recall, as I recall. <laughs> And so all of us... We're back to the uh, location shooting. Extremely cold night. Uh, the time we were there in Inverness, uh, the weather was very, very cold. There are a lot of locals sitting in the audience there who loved uh, participating. I think they particularly liked it because of Janet Lee. I mean, she was the, the most famous thing in the area at the time. And as I remember, the night we were shooting that, the owner of the restaurant wanted us out, so we had to send Janet Lee over to uh, placate him until we finished shooting. <laughs> and she was a trooper. She she went right on with it. So we must redouble our efforts. Work together. This guy that pops in here to tell the sheriff uh, the message that the fog is coming is Barry Bernardi, who started out in Halloween with us as our craft service person. He's actually in Halloween. The the, the red truck um, by the um, by the train crossing is his and he's the dead body. That's right. right. He's he? now a producer. Yeah, he went on to become our associate producer on uh, Escape from New York. He was the location manager here. This is done by, you know, Fogger, special effects guy. All miniatures here, right? Yep. Absolutely. So now we're setting up that the town is getting cut off. Uh, Communication is getting cut off, so Adrienne will be the only one who's able to uh, speak to everyone. I mean, that's traditional horror film stuff, too, which is to break out communications, and so therefore, you know, the army can't come save you or whatever. Um, this is shot, actually, over here in Los Angeles, um, near Altadena or something, right? That's right. And it's Transformer. We went out there for a half a day of work of location. We're having to blast the fog in there because of the wind outside. Yeah, this, I remember this effect, we couldn't get this effect to really work very, very well. And um, I, ended, I think we made a compromise on this. And I think he wanted it to be sucked into this machine and that effect to happen. Once again, this is a plate of all the lights going out. Uh, I think that was done by a little miniature with miniature pin lights. Mm -hmm. And now we're in the dark. We should all proceed. And I think what she's doing is she's telling them to go home and, you know, be safe and disband. A lot of the residents are still living up there. A lot of the folks that you see in the shot. And we're closing in on the last uh, last act of the film here. We're into it. Now, this is uh, more special effects shots. We really had an ambitious uh, amount of effects in this movie. 
I actually operated this shot as she ran down, as I recall, and did a she's trying to, to so so job. She's trying to start an emergency generator here. That's right. It's great uh, kind of moody lighting. Uh, now, as I recall, Deborah, that uh, when the fog uh, seeps into this particular location, we did that actually live, and, and it turned out extremely well. Well, we were going to do it as a miniature, and then when we shot the this as a plate, it just really, really worked out very, very well. We didn't have to shoot it as a miniature. This is on a sound stage. They're driving up actually across the sound stage. The the doors to the outside of um, Melrose Avenue are just a few feet away from the back of the truck. And here we are again in uh, Tamales Bay in this uh, beautiful little house. Uh, One of the nice things about Dean Cundy's lighting is that the blacks are always so dark. I mean, that's one of the things that you look for when you, when you shoot, looking for a cameraman for especially night work. And, you know, we certainly shoot a lot of our movies at night. Halloween took place all in one night. This is a lot of night. Escape from New York was all in one night. And I think that the, the fog worked out so well here because it was a very cold night and the fog stayed close to the water and didn't dissipate into the air. It was very effective. Now she's alerting the town. We're back on location with a, a, a tented in uh, window. We shot this in the daytime and the fog back there is being controlled by technicians. We're cutting around from various location sets. Building tension. Someone listen to me. My and essentially everybody's going to get on the road and all head up to the church, which is where she tells them all to go. Of course, only our principals show up at the church. <laughs> A low budget movie. <laughs> right. Are your windows all closed? We're going to have a little uh, death scene here. Pretty soon, uh, Mrs. Coberts bites the dust. Is she the sixth? Fifth? I can't remember now. Hmm. And she sends a little tie off someplace to his room, I think, right? And then she opens up the door. It's the one thing I've learned. If there's a knock at the door and it's at night, you don't open the door. Especially if there's fog outside. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Mrs. Colbert's is sending Adrian's son away to safety, and she's going to go out and investigate this. And uh, the fog out there is being made by a fogger. I believe we enhanced this particular scene uh, with some of our later shooting. Um, I think this was the first time we used the fog effect, too. Is that right? Yeah. No shot right on location and building up tension. There's a tent outside the, the front there, door there. There he is. There's the ghost. Originally there was one ghost when we added this uh, little ending section. That is a miniature fog around the uh, around the cabin uh, on the on the Tamales Bay. Now once again that was built on a soundstage and draped in black velvet. We're uh, intercutting various locations here. Please, my son is trapped. These are the basic forms of composite photography that we do now. You know, that used to be done then. And everybody's racing to the church. And right now the ghost is coming in after, um, after the little boy. But Adrienne's character has reached out. If anybody's in, you know, around my house, go save my little boy. And that's why they pull in. And uh, Tommy Lee Wallace again time. is coming through the door. He's always coming through doors and <laughs> closets. He played the shape a couple of times. Yeah, in Halloween. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially up in the closet scene. I believe oh. Ty is going to get rescued here in a second by uh, Tom Atkins and. Uh, through the candy glass window, and in comes Tommy to get him, but misses. And off we go. And there is the miniature shot, the miniature fog in the live location. This is the old stuck in the stuck in the mud uh, sequence. Um, we jacked the, the truck up and we're, we're assuming that Jamie cannot drive this truck, which is a good assumption. That was done with a light gag behind the, uh, the ghost in order to silhouette him.
They're being surrounded. We're, we're shooting from various locations here. One is in the garage of the um, service station out there in Tamales Bay. And the, the point of views, as I recall, uh, were also shot there surrounding the truck. And they back out on location. Uh, extremely well-constructed sequence by, uh, again, by Tommy Lee Wallace in the editing room. That's fog to put over the shot in the foreground. We were really running by the skin of our teeth in this film, but uh, that's what happens in a low-budget movie. This is real um, fog, uh, fog in foreground uh, was created there at the moment, and you see it dissipate in real life. And we're back to uh, the Olima uh, location by the ranch house. Um, you see very, very simply that a lot of these sequences were shot in uh, very few shots. Uh, Either, either wide shots or, or uh, over shoulders. Uh, there except I for am, the right back there. Yeah, an there you are, Deborah. You're talking to uh, somebody back there. Yeah, probably Barry Bernardi. No, I don't know who that is. Another effect shot. Uh, well, I think this one was done as a plate with the glass in front of it, and then we shot through the glass up on the hillside and then added <coughs> the fog in afterwards. Adrian did a great job with this particular uh, with this particular sequence here. Uh, she's very emotional about her son. Doesn't know whether he's alive or not. This was before we had uh, we had uh, our boy, and uh, but she she did a great job with it. And now we're on to uh, another reel coming down Bear Valley Road. Um, as I recall, this is the uh, the infamous Reel 9. When we were finishing up uh, the movie, there was one reel that no one had touched that needed to be cut, uh, and uh, it needed to be done right away, so I sat down and spent a whole night recutting it. And it was a thankless, bleary task, but uh, we got it done. This particular sequence here where the fog comes down the street towards the truck was shot in reverse. Because of the wind, uh, the, fog, the fog would not come toward us. Here it comes, this is a reverse shot. And the truck had to be backed up in reverse. So what you're seeing is the fog gathering. Now this truck is, uh, is actually uh, going forward at this point. So everything is reversed. I can remember shooting that. That was actually really interesting, the way you apply the logic, reverse the logic, and you get the thing to work. We actually only shot in this town one night. I didn't like us too much, but... We're intercutting a location scene with a, with a shot uh, on a poor man's process, and... Uh, we're intercutting all our characters for the final confrontation with the ghosts, and... Uh, the man basically responsible uh, for all the uh, the goings on, the uh, the priest. This is the famous uh, real nine that uh, no one uh, wanted to to recut. All the characters are gathering together. Now we're back in uh, Altadena at the at the small church, and uh, this is uh, up on Mulholland Drive. Um, a lot of our intercuts here are are pieced together from material that we shot on location and uh, material that we shot later. We're actually going up a hill now in Inverness and cutting to Altadena. It was all fairly well planned out, um, but again, we created a great deal of this in the editing room. Well, part of the reason why we cut back and forth like this is because um, from Alima to um, to Altadena is because we couldn't take Hal Holbrook on location with us. It would have been more expensive to do that, so um, we put all of his scenes here. He actually never leaves the church. That's a live location uh, that we shot one night in... Uh, That's up in Inverness. Inverness, up... cutting with the church in Altadena. So their POV is 400 miles away. comes the fog, we're going to be cutting into uh, our, our set again. One of the first times I used uh, two cameras was in the scene coming up. Didn't do a very good job, I wasn't sure how to do it, but uh, 
two angles on one scene, we actually happen to have a second camera. You know, this that scene in there is sort of reminiscent of the scene in Assault Precinct 13 when they're at the police station waiting for the, the attack. You know, it's kind of very Howard Hawks-ish. I recycled all Hawks' <laughs> films, Deborah. Now, this is an effects shot that was rather, rather, rather well done. It's a shot of the hillside, and we're dumping a miniature fog over a, a, a black velvet set. And in a minute, you'll see a live shot uh, where the fog uh, covers camera. That's an extremely windy day. We were lucky to get that particular shot. And here's the uh, two-camera setup that I did where there's a lot of overlapping dialogue. And I actually had to make the cut from one to the other. Camera tracks into the door. And uh, we're back into Altadena. Over by the window? It can do us no good now. The movie uh, um, originally was uh, had, a, had a much different ending, but we, uh, because of, of uh, the market at the time and because we wanted to come out with a frightening film, we, we worked it a great deal. A very nice little miniature shot. Now we're back into Raleigh Studios. This is a, a full-size miniature. And... Um, the ghosts are at the gate, coming in to get Adrienne. She's going to eventually end up on another set that we, and we built, and we, we built the top of the lighthouse, which uh, was done again that last month before we had to release the film. Yeah, so we actually intensified the um, tension here uh, with the fog and her battle with the ghosts um, at a later date. Now, a great deal of the plot is uh, is discovered in this particular scene in the overlapping dialogue. Um, now, looking back on it, it seems to be a little gobbledygook, but uh, a lot of ghost stories are. That's my fa that's my hand. That's right, and you're the stand-in for Janet Lee. We shot a, <laughs> an insert at that point to to cover uh, some dialogue that we wanted to bridge over and emphasize that the book had the answer to all the problems of the characters. In the background, there's Tommy Wallace, I think, again, coming through the set. <laughs> Tommy was a close friend of mine since fourth grade and came out to California uh, with me to USC. And I think he probably regrets our association after having put on that black makeup and the rags and uh, worked for hours at a time being a ghost. And he's uh, shoving through the door, and that's his hand also, and that's his hand also. He's really a handy, uh, handy ghost to have around. <laughs> this is the barricade scene. Uh, two things are happening at once. Uh, the ghosts are coming in, and the answer is uh, is being sought by uh, Janet Lee and Hal Holbrook. And Adrienne is getting uh, attacked by uh, Tommy Wallace. Tommy Lee Wallace. <laughs> The Gold Cross was a, was a touch from the script. Uh, the cross eventually turns into the what we referred to as the Atomic Cross, done with light bulbs and uh, Well, the idea of the whole, the, at this point, is, is that the gold that was uh, taken from the ship after it crashed was made into this cross and hidden. And these ghosts have come back for what was rightfully theirs. And so there'll be a confrontation between Hal Holbrook and the, the sort of lead ghost. He's at playing one point. the. He's playing that that cross is heavy. It actually is extremely light, and uh, he's doing a good job of making it seem heavy. That's Tommy, uh, actually grabbing his wife's hair and attacking her, and off goes Hal to to uh, sacrifice himself for the betterment of mankind. The redemptive quality of his character was something I think that appealed to him. Although, as I recall, Hal didn't like the movie too much when he saw it. But uh, such is life. Now, Adrienne is on a set uh, in Raleigh Studios. Uh, I believe I operated this particular shot with the ghost on one side and Adrienne on the other. It's really beautiful lighting by Dean. Hal is in the uh, sanctuary and is about to confront uh, Rob Bottin and uh, some extras dressed in black. It was very interesting how we did this lighting effect on, on uh, this cross. It was actually done with, um, uh, I guess we painted on something called scotch bright, And um, when you reflect light onto the scotch bright, it creates color and glows. And that's how we made it to glow. Um, Rob Bottin made a little mask on this, on this lead ghost as he's walking. That's him walking down the aisle. He's a tall guy anyway, and he um, 
he created a mask that would glow. Here's Adrienne on the set that we were referring to earlier. This was built uh, after we'd finished the movie. Those are my hands and my feet. I was uh, doubling for Adrienne on certain shots. This is the Alfred Hitchcock North by Northwest sequence. Uh, I believe, again, Tommy Lee Wallace is rising up the uh, ladder and Adrienne is scrambling at the very top. We built this set on a soundstage and... Uh, and shot it uh, at the very last minute. And Hal is confronting uh, Rob Botine there. Now Rob has uh, a mask on that has uh, uh, the uh, front screen material that glows and that's controlled by a light uh, off uh, through a mirror. And now their confrontation. I thought Rob made an excellent ghost. And offers up the uh, the goal to give back to the ghosts and redeem himself. Take me. And thereby hopefully saving the town and the world. Adrian is again uh, crawling. We're, we're coming up to a worm face in a minute. Um, but first Tommy's gonna come up the, uh, up the ladder. I was wondering why Tommy never wanted to make any more horror movies. Well, I you think know it's what? because he was- a I don't think ghost. we even paid Tommy to be in this movie. Uh, as an actor. And he'll never let us forget <laughs> it. Whoa. My so hands sh and feet again. We shove the camera down the set towards the toward the ghost. Here comes Wormface as Adrian lashes out. And Rob Bottin's uh, beautiful uh, mask with a couple of worms in it. It really worked out well. The audience was totally disgusted by what they saw, <laughs> which was our intent at the time. Uh -huh. This That's is shot from, shot. The, from the rafters of the set, looking straight down. Uh, the camera was nailed to a board. That's a great shot. I forgot about that shot. Really now, here's the mention. atomic cross that we're talking about, which was uh, uh, done with the front screen material, and uh, a lot of lights in the background on Hal. It was very, very hot. We're, we're drawing the climax to a close. Uh, kind of the... Uh, trapped on an electric current there, and Hal is uh, burning up from the lights. But uh, Tommy pulls him off the cross just as Adrian is about to get it. Uh, always looks a, a great deal better when you're looking at it from the perspective of years later. Uh, we crank the light up all the way at this point, and uh, to give us a big bang here at the very end, and it fades out, and then they're gone. It's a uh, Kind of a cheap trick, but we played it off later with the with Hal's uh, epiphany at the at the very end. Uh, well, it's also very reminiscent of Hitchcock's The Birds when suddenly the birds are gone and everything is quiet and still and you know peaceful again. And like I say, we just keep recycling these old movies. <laughs> and now we bring the the story down to a, a quiet moment. Uh, the audience thinks that it's over with. We we spent uh, about the last 90 minutes setting up uh, an attack of the ghosts, and now we're going to take them away. A lot happens in supernatural stories that that the unexplained uh, really comes and affects your lives and then goes away. And we were applying that to kind of an old-fashioned Lovecraftian idea. Adrienne is. Uh, looks around to see that uh, the ghosts, in fact, have disappeared, and she is, uh, she's saved once again. A lot of this was constructed in the editing room, taking uh, moments and shots from other places and put together to give it the sense of, of completion, to give the dramatic sense that everything winds down. But I think, you know, what happens is this character then goes on the air and sums it up for us in sort of a very moral way. She does, and, and Adrienne gives the uh, keep watching the skies scene right. uh, from the thing. Right. As we come out in... Uh, from the original thing. That's correct, right. not mine. <laughs> that's right. Everything is quieting down, everything is gone, it's all peaceful again. All our main characters apparently have survived. Um, unfortunately, Hal Holbrook doesn't, uh, doesn't really make it, but... Uh, we're letting the wind take away the, the fog on that windy night we were talking about earlier. As you see, this is a forward shot. Uh, if you printed this in reverse, the effect uh, would be quite different. This is Point Reyes uh, Station, the main street. 
we're back to all the locations that we've been to in the film, kind of summing up uh, the feelings. Now we're we're back out on the uh, lighthouse location, and which is what you did in the end of Halloween, also. If that's you went right. back to all the different locations. And Adrienne is giving her final speech. Uh, in one moment, it vanished. Do you think maybe we should make a sequel? I'm ready when you are. <laughs> And if we don't wake up to find ourselves safe... Ghost stories are hard to do. This, this movie was, was very difficult, at least for me as a director. But uh, I'm very happy with the way it turned out. It's had a great cast. It had a great look to it. And uh, with the means that we had to make the film, Deborah, I feel we really, really came through. Yeah, I do too. I think it's a classic, and it's very different from Halloween. I think you did a great job. Uh, and you. Thanks. And uh, now Hal is going to uh, get his just desserts. Uh, he was rather nervous about this particular sequence because uh, Rob Bottin is the is is Blake, and uh, his he's holding a real sword, and uh, actually takes a big swing at Hal to to uh, decapitate him. And we had to use a long lens and keep uh, Rob at a certain distance and. It's one of those things where you think something's very simple, but it turns out to be rather complicated. And it's timing. It's all about the timing here. We again use our, our last trick in the, in the film. Uh, I think at this point the audience knows what's coming. Uh, and here's our shot where, where Hal comes in and reacts. Uh, there's a, a slight moment we stole when the, when the camera was rolling. Now we have our swing. <laughs> and the movie is over, and we run the credits. Uh, we redid, redid the music, we redid uh, the credits, we redid parts of the film. And oh, that's who, Elizabeth Solly, that's your ex-girlfriend. That's right. Oh, it wasn't Elizabeth Dane. That's right. One of the first loves of my life. A lot of the names here, are Dick Baxter and Dan O'Bannon are- uh, Nick Castle. People that I went Sandy to school Fidel. with. Tommy Wallace was played by Buck Flowers, an actor I've used many times, Mrs. Kobritz. But uh, to wrap up, I think um, looking back on the movie now, I'm extremely proud of it. And I'm glad we did it. And uh, it has turned out to be uh, a kind of a minor classic in, in the horror genre. And uh, it was great to do. And it was great to sit here with you today and talk about it. Yeah, it was really fun. We'll see you guys at the movies and uh, take it easy.